Let's take our Bibles tonight, and I'm going to invite you to turn in it to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 is the story of that centurion's servant that was sick. You remember that one? It's a great story. I think it also appears in Matthew chapter 8 as well. But Luke chapter 7 is where I want you to look with me. Uh, let's pick up in verse 2. And a certain centurion's servant which, who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when Jesus, when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself. I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I am also a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. Well, verse 9 says, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. He turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. Let's take a moment and look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you tonight for this wonderful account of this healing of the centurion's servant. It is an amazing story. We know it's true. We thank you for your healing power. We thank you for the authority you have over everything and everyone. We pray tonight that you just give us the spiritual truth that you want to teach us through it. And Lord, uh, stir our hearts tonight with it. Oh God, I pray that as a result of our time together that you'd be pleased and we'd, uh, we'd fulfill your will for being here with an open Bible tonight. Keep us from distraction. Glorify yourself. And you alone, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. You know, I think I've heard it said uh, a long time ago, your reputation is what people think that you are, but your character is what God knows you to be. It's possible for us to fool people and uh, make them think that we're something that we really are not. What they see when people look at us may not be real. Also, it's true that at times uh, people don't consider other people to be very much at all, not to be impressed at all, but God does. <laughs> there are three opinions in these verses that I've read uh, briefly for you tonight three opinions about this centurion. There's the opinion of the Jewish leaders. There's the opinion of the centurion himself. And then there's Jesus's opinion of this man. And of course, the opinion that always matters the most, what does Jesus think about a person? You know, what do you think Jesus would say about you? What does Jesus think about you? Well, I want to look at that. Let's first of all begin at uh, uh, verses 4 and 5, pick it up and, and see the opinion of the Jews regarding the centurion. They had a, a, a good opinion of him. And there are two areas that they describe this uh, man uh, that deals with relationships. First of all, there is the man's relationship vertically. When I talk about a vertical relationship, I'm talking about a person's relationship with God. And we get some insight in verse 5. He's a man that is said to love the Jewish nation, 
or the people, and also, out of his own pocket, he built them a synagogue. So think about that for a moment. Here's a man that had a very unique, uh, he, he's very unique because of his background. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Roman soldier. He was a Roman centurion, a Roman captain of a hundred men. He was a man that was a Gentile, a pagan Gentile, and yet he's characterized here of being a deeply religious man. He's a man that uh, is deeply re religious, and he respects the moral values and standards of Judaism. Perhaps here he is a, a pagan that uh, would be a worshiper of many gods, Judaism, they worship one God, and he respected that. And so vertically, this is something unusual about this man. He was a God-fearer. That's what we would call him. He was a God-fearing man. And then on a horizontal level, on a level with people, look at what we read in verse 2. This centurion's servant who was sick and ready to die, was on his dying bed, was dear unto this man. Now think about it. The centurion, he's a tough guy. He's a military man. And he's, he's serving under the Roman government. And you know, the Roman army, I mean, they just crushed any opponent. So here's a tough, disciplined, military man. And yet, his consideration of his servant is he's very caring concerning this servant. He has an unusual attitude toward his servant. He has an attitude that he valued his servant. He sa it says he was dear unto him. He was precious to him. He loved him. A very unusual attitude also toward the Jews. If you know anything about the the attitude between Jew and Romans in that day, there was a mutual hatred. They hated each other. And yet he has, he's stationed among the Jewish people, and he's there in the city, in the city of Capernaum because that was a major stop, that uh, was a toll stop on a major highway that ran through the Middle East, the Via Maris. It ran from Egypt to Damascus, and uh, this was a, a major toll booth that uh, the Roman soldiers would make sure that the tolls were paid. And so here he is, but notice his attitude in that fifth verse that we've already mentioned. He had a very respectful attitude toward the Jewish people. And also he was very generous. He built them a synagogue. And look at what the Jews said about him when they came to Jesus. The Jewish leaders came to Jesus in verse 4, and they, they begged Jesus that he would come and, and help this man's servant. They were sent by the man, and they said this, that he was worthy for whom he should do this. They felt that he, was, that, that he carried weight that he carried value, that he deserved this. He was a good man, and he deserved this. So that's the Jews' opinion of the centurion. But let's look at the centurion's opinion of himself. Drop down to verses 6 and 7 with me. And by the way, his opinion about himself is really the basis for what Jesus says about him, when Jesus gives, gives his opinion, he, he calls him a man of great faith. Well, the basis for this man's great faith is seen in his opinion of himself. And I want you to see that. Though he is a man, of course, with great authority, uh, evidently he had money. He built the synagogue for them. He had leadership ability. He was the, the, uh, the centurion. And yet look at what he says. Jesus went with them, with these Jewish elders, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion didn't come himself. He sent representatives in his place, sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself. I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. 
Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but saying a word, and my servant shall be healed. So what's his opinion of himself? He had a, a humbled view of himself, wouldn't you say? Though he had all of this uh, ability, he felt a deep unworthiness in himself. In fact, the word worthy in verse 6 is a different word than the Jewish uh, elders used in verse 4. The word in verse 4 talks about having, uh, deserving it. The, the word that the centurion is using about himself in verse 6, when he says, I'm not worthy, he's saying, I'm not sufficient for you to even step over the threshold and put your foot in my house. I'm not even worthy of that. I'm not, and listen, Jesus wasn't some big name rabbi. Jesus was a peasant. Jesus was a poor Galilean rabbi. And yet this centurion says, I'm not even sufficient to have you come near me. That's why I've sent representatives in my place. I don't even, I don't even feel competent to be in your presence, let alone have you come into my house and give you hospitality? So he approaches Jesus through these representatives. Roman soldiers were not known for humility, trust me. Especially humility towards the Jewish people. This is amazing humility that this man takes because he realizes that confronting Jesus, he is in the presence of true greatness, that he had, that there's no comparison between the two of them. You know, it takes humility to exercise faith because faith is the opposite of depending upon yourself. Faith is God dependence and uh, the other is just prideful flesh dependence. Faith focuses on God, but the flesh focuses on our own resources and our own abilities. So his opinion of himself, he humbled himself. He had a humble view of himself, I should say. But also, he had an exalted view of God. How do we see that? Well, in the words that he says in verse 8, he says, I also am a man set under authority and having under me soldiers. And I say unto one soldier, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. You know what he's saying there? He's revealing that he has a very exalted view of Jesus. This centurion saw a parallel between the way that he commanded his soldiers and the way that Jesus commands disease. Because they were both under authority, they both had the right to exercise that authority. And if his authority produced such results that he mentions in verse 8, well, how much more results could the authority of Jesus produce? This is really, on the part of this man, tremendous insight into the life of Jesus. Basically, and uh, he, he says it in, in this uh, passage, in verse 7, he says, Just say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. That's the kind of authority that you have. He's basically saying, you just say the word and things happen. The power of the word of God. Folks, if we believe like this man does, the promises that we find in God's word, because we know the God of the word, because we know and we are focused on him and his greatness, we'll never tremble. We'll never worry. We'll never fear because we'll know that he is greater than the biggest problem that we will ever face in our lives. 
This is why we have to remember this. Here is a man who, in just a moment, in that ninth verse, Jesus will give his opinion of the man, and he'll say that he has great faith. Well, his faith was great because he was totally convinced, even before it happened, that Jesus possessed supreme power, supreme authority over every obstacle, and had the absolute power to bring about the change that was needed, even before the thing that he asked for had actually happened. That's great faith. Let's look at Jesus' opinion of them. Verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And he turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. So, Jesus' comprehension of this centurion's faith was, of course, even before he knew the man, even before he met the man, he comprehended ahead of time this centurion's simple faith. And it made Jesus marvel. See that verse 9, that word marvel? Jesus marveled. Now, there were many times when you read the Gospels that people marvel at Jesus, right? They watch him, they hear him, and they marvel at his words. They marvel at his deeds. There's only two times in all four Gospels that we are told that Jesus marvels. One time he's in his hometown of Nazareth, and he marvels at their unbelief. And then here, where he marvels at a man's belief. That's what makes him marvel. Here he stood, when, when it says he marveled, it means he stood and saw this man with deep admiration of this man's personal belief. You know what makes Jesus amazed? When he finds people humble enough to place all of their confidence in him, in his authority, in his ability, in his power. I wonder, have we ever made Jesus marvel? Was it that he marveled at our belief or at our unbelief? Jesus marvels, and then he works a miracle, right? Verse 10 they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. The centurion knew that Jesus, he could heal that servant instantly from a distance. And exactly that's what happened. He found, they found the servant whole, that is, totally healthy, without Jesus uttering a word, like be healed, without Jesus uttering a word, without Jesus acting in any way, no act on his part, without even needing to go there, meet the person, be in contact, see him, nothing of that at all. He was made whole. That's really what the word shalom means. We say it means peace, yes, but it means wholeness. It means soundness. Like when someone that is sick is well again, we say they're in sound health. That's what the word whole means. The man was completely healed, and he was healed body, soul, and spirit is the picture here. He was made whole. And uh, this miracle that Jesus performs, I'm telling you, you and I can see the same kind of miracles like that if we believe God, if we exercise faith. Online businesses are impacted by customer reviews. You know how they bug you after you buy something online to review their product, give them so many stars? 
what well, online businesses are their their reputations are impacted by a customer's review. In fact, you may have seen the commercial, and I'm sure there are many companies that offer to fix bad reviews, online reviews, to enhance uh, your personal, uh, your online presence. Well, in closing, I want us to think this. If Jesus would write his review of your life, what would he marvel at? Your belief or your unbelief? How many stars would he give you for your belief? Let's pause and close in prayer.